Hey guys, it's Chill here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. This is part two of my mini series on normal mapping. In this video, we are going to fix the issue that was highlighted at the end of part one, which is going to give me the rare opportunity to teach you guys about some software engineering principles, specifically some of the solid stuff. Then at the end, I'm going to give you a little more formal definition of the normal mapping technique that we've been using up until now. Highlight its limitations, setting the stage for part three. We left the last video on a little bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, if you look here, you can see what I'm talking about. It's the, uh, this is the normal mapping that we had done in the last video, but it's kind of, uh, it's kind of hecked up if you, you know what I mean. I mean, this obviously like it shouldn't get darker when you change your viewing position. That shouldn't affect the, uh, the diffuse, but it is affecting the diffuse because like I said at the end of the last video, our current shader works in view space. So all the things that are passed to the pixel shader, they have to be transformed into view space. But obviously these normals aren't being transformed into view space. They're just being read directly from the uh, texture shader. These normals aren't being transformed into view space. They're just being directly read from the texture and used. So we really got two problems here. One problem is we are not taking into consideration any transforms on the object. And the second is we're not taking into consideration the view transform. And both these problems can be solved uh, basically by making this these matrices available to the pixel shader. If the pixel shader has those matrices, then it can apply them to the normals. Now there's two ways that we can go about this. We can do the coward's way out, which is basically we can pass in the matrices as a parameter, as a per pixel parameter here into the pixel shader. That's not very efficient, but it'll work and it's very easy. The, uh, the brave man's way is to actually also bind this constant buffer of uh, matrices to the pixel shader and that's what we're actually going to be doing it's going to take more work but it's the it's the proper way to go about things and more importantly it's actually going to allow me to do something that i'm not able to do that often i'm going to be able to introduce to you guys a little bit about you know software engineering theory and principles that sort of thing is, is harder to do with toy examples to think them up but when i find a good example when we're doing something else and i see that oh i can use this as a teachable moment to teach some uh, software engineering principles I think I want to take that opportunity. Now the bindable that is responsible for binding those matrices is called the transform C buff. And this guy is a special kind of bindable because it actually has another bindable inside of it. It's a shell and its job is to form a bridge between the, con the vertex constant buffer bindable and the drawable. So it maintains a reference to the drawable and when it's time to bind the transform C buff, it gets the transform information from the drawable and then it um, updates the vertex constant buffer and then binds the vertex constant buffer to the pipeline. Now we basically want to do the same thing, but we want to do it uh, for pixel constant buffer. So we want to have also a pixel constant buffer, which does the same thing. Now there's several ways that we could approach this. The simplest way would be to basically just copy and paste this transform C buff and make it like a transform C buff pixel shader or something like that. And that would work. It's copy pasta. It's duplicating a lot of code. It's duplicating a lot of resources when you don't actually need to. So it's not a very clean solution. That would be what I, what we would call scrub tier programming. Now we can amp things up a little bit. We could say, well, this transform C buff, it's a composite inside of it it is comprised of a uh, vertex constant buffer. So what if we just added another static into here, pixel constant buffer, and then when it binds, it will bind both the vertex and the pixel. And that's, that's a better idea, but the problem with that is that if we modify the transform C buff, its behavior like that, we radically modify its behavior, everything that has been using this up until now will be broken and we will have to refactor all those things. And again, we could, you know, fall back to copy pasta meta. We could copy and paste this and then create a version that has both vertex and pixel and then leave this version the way it is. But like I said, copy pasta ain't the greatest. Now this actually relates to one of the core principles of uh, software engineering. Very famous acronym in software engineering, SOLID. 
And you know, a lot of people have heard of solid, but many of them don't really have an idea of what the hell it means. You know, I don't know what the big deal is. I mean, you just look at the names, like Liskov Substitution Principle. I mean, it's right there in the name. What's not to understand? Are you serious? This is torture. You're torturing me and everyone else watching. Wait. Anyways, jokes aside, the one that I'm talking about right now is the open-closed principle. Software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. And that relates to the problem we're having right here. We want to extend this, take its existing behavior and add a little something to it. Uh, we don't want to modify this thing because it'll break a bunch of stuff that's already depending on it. We want to be able to extend it while leaving the original uh, having the same interface, the same behavior. And the plan of action would be simple. We inherit from transform cbuff, we create our new version. Uh, in our new version, we, all, we add the static uh, for the pixel constant buffer and we override bind. And in our bind, we invoke the behavior of the parent, and then we add the additional behavior of also doing the, uh, the pixel constant buffer stuff. And that's generally how you want to operate. The only problem is the parent transform is generated inside the bind function here, and the, uh, the transform structure itself is created in there. So that's locked up in this bind function. It's not available to us when we want to bind uh, to the pixel shader. So we'd have to do all this work. We'd have to double all this work. And that's not a good idea. So our current system here, it isn't very uh, amenable to the extension by inheritance because of the way we built it. And that brings us to actually one of the other principles single responsibility principle here and it says here our class should only have a single responsibility but this also applies to functions now i don't like the name single responsibility because really you can word things in such a way that it's this is a single responsibility when actually it's doing two very separate things so single is very uh subjective in my opinion but what you can say is that the less responsibility you lump together in a single class or a single function, generally the better, because the more ability you have to separate those things out, to take part of it and use it somewhere else, rather than having those things always stuck together. So what we want to do in here is we want to separate out the responsibility of generating the transform from the responsibility of updating and binding the, uh, the bindable. And that's what you see in this first commit here. Refactor cbuff for increased extensibility. So what I'm doing is I have to make the transform structure protected because it needs to be available to the children. And uh, here I create some functions here. I've split them out from the bind. And this is the update bind impl. This is what does the updating and binding of the vertex constant buffer. And then I do get transforms, and this is what gets the transforms out of the uh, the parent. Now let me switch it to inline view here. I like that better. So yeah, bind in the transform C buff in the parent just calls the implementation function here, and it uses get transforms to get the structure. The update bind impl just does the update and the bind, and then the get transforms does the gets transform stuff. So now those two operations are separate and they're both being called in bind here. And then that enables us to for us to create the bindable for dual vertex pixel transform binding. And I call it uh, transform cbuff double boy because why the hell not? What the fuck was that? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we inherit from transform cbuff we override bind, we create another implementation uh, for binding the pixel constant buffer, and here we add the pixel constant buffer, and then in here it's not, it's not that complicated. Update bind impl is exactly what you would expect, it's the same stuff we had for the vertex, and the overrided bind gets to transforms, and then calls the impl for the transform c buff, the one with the pixel shader, and then it calls the impl for our version. And it gives us very clean, very dry code, very nice 
engineering principles being demonstrated here, in my opinion. And then all that's left is to actually test that. So in the test plane, what we're going to do is we are going to replace transform C buff with transform C buff double boy. And this constructor here, it takes in the, uh, the slot to which the vertex shader and the pixel shader will be bound. So we're going to bind the vertex shader to zero like we've been doing before. But for the pixel shader, we're going to bind those matrices to slot two, right? Slot zero, one, two. This is where we put them. And then down here, we're going to multiply our normal, our sampled normal out of the texture by this model view transformation matrix. And again, normals, you don't want to translate them. You only want to rotate them. So we're only taking the three by three. And if we run this, our normal mapping should now be looking a lot better. So right away, it looks to me like the, uh, the specular highlight is in a better position. Let's disable the normal map and we can see it remains at the same spot, whether it's enabled or disabled. So it's looking a lot better there. And as we go oblique to the wall here, it doesn't change its brightness. It's still the same relative brightness. And we can also rotate the wall itself and we see it works as you would expect. Beautiful, normal map completely finished, feature complete, or is it? So up until now, we've only been working with a single plane and we've been doing our normal mapping on that. Now let's try it on something a little more complicated, on a cube. So in this commit here, I just, there's a bunch of changes, but it's all basically just me implementing a test cube, another kind, another kind of drawable like the test plane. So I have to add the geometry back in here for the cube, and then I had to refactor it to work with dynamic vertex, and then I had to make some changes to vertex, but it's not a big deal. Long story short, we now have a test cube. And the test cube in its constructor, it's hard-coded to use the brick wall texture and normal map. You can see here it's also using our uh, CBuff double boy. So here's our scene with the textured cube. All right, so far it doesn't look too weird. Um, well, right now we can see this is already looking a little weird. But let me demonstrate exactly how weird it is. We're going to move the light. If I can get my light, light boy here. We're going to move that over just a little bit. And we're going to push the Z down here. And look what happens. Look what happens to this wall here. So all the stuff past the light here is getting lit, but all the stuff in front of it here is black. That doesn't make any sense. We should have light that radiates outwards. It's the uh, strongest around here. And as we go outwards, it should get dimmer and dimmer, but that's not what's happening. So what the heck is this? Maybe if you want, you can pause the video and you can try to figure out for yourself why this is the effect that we're getting. So did you figure it out? The answer is that our normal map has vectors that are generally pointing in the Z direction. There's variance, but in general, the average is in the Z. And then we flip them so that they're pointing in the negative Z. So all of our normals that we sample start off pointing in the negative Z direction. So these ones pointing in the negative Z. These ones here on this face of the cube are also pointing in the negative Z. So the normal for this point here is pointing in this direction, and this one is pointing in this direction. So the normal at this point is pointing in this direction, opposite the direction of the light, and so it's not getting lit. The normals are pointing in the wrong direction. The only surface with correct normals is the front face here. You can see if I pull this back, no, wrong way. If I pull this back, it is getting lit as you would expect. But these ones here, and if we just move up, we can see these ones here, again, they are not getting lit as you would expect. And I mean, we could modify the shader or we could modify the normal map and make them point in a different direction. And then maybe this surface, this top surface then would be correct. But again, all the other surfaces would be blown to heck. So obviously with our current system here, we are not able to use a single texture to texture all the faces of the cube. We can't take this single texture and repeat it for every single face. It only works for one face because all the faces are facing in different directions. 
Now, while it's not possible to replicate a texture across every different face of the cube, we could use a single cube skin, and that would work. So we could make one face, the normals are generally in the negative uh, Z direction, and then here, they would be in, you know, the positive one Z direction, and then I don't... Listen, my spatial awareness isn't good enough to figure out which one of these is X and Y, but I'm going to take a guess and say this is going to be negative X, and this would be positive X, and then this would be negative Y and positive Y. Those might, those might be messed up, but either way you get the idea. Uh, and a texture like this, a normal map like this, this is called object space normal mapping. All the vectors in this normal map are uh, relative to the object space of the mesh. So when you wrap a cube with this, you're going to have the, the, uh, the normals pointing in the direction that you expect. Um, some will be pointing in this direction, some will be pointing in this direction, some will be pointing in this direction. Again, object space normal mapping. Now, object space normal maps are very easy to spot because they're more they're a lot more colorful than uh, tangent space, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, later on. Uh, because if they wrap around an object, uh, some of them are going to be pointing in the x direction, some of them are be pointing in the z, some of them are be pointing in the y, positive, negative. So you're going to have basically the full range of colors almost. Here's a good side-by-side -side for you. This one is in tangent space, this one is in object space. Now object space normal mapping is actually, it's very easy to implement, as you can see, we've already implemented it. All you really gotta do is apply your matrix transformation to the normal in the pixel shader and you're done. Um, but it has two major downsides which generally end up with the result that we don't use it that often. The one downside is the one I've shown you here. It you have to have, you can only use it with full skins, one-to-one -one skin of the object, because if you are repeating a texture across the object, in different parts of the object, that texture is going to be pointing in different directions, uh, but it can, only ha it can only store one normal in one direction. So you can't, you know, take a single square texture and repeat it over all the faces of a cube, for example. You have to have a one-to-one -one between the texture and points on the cube, and then you can use object space for it. Now the second thing that makes it so that uh, object space can't be used is animation. So imagine a very simple case of animation. We've got a plane here, but that plane can bend at the middle and fold into itself. So if we use a single square texture to normal map it, in general, uh, the normals are going to be pointing out from the face of the plane, let's say. But when we bend it, when we animate this mesh, these normals will remain pointing in the same direction, but these normals will have to be transformed. You'll have to transform part of the normal map while leaving the other part the same. And that's very tricky to do. Maybe not so tricky for that simple example I gave you, but when you take into account bone skin animation with all sorts of, you know, interpolations and all sorts of different bone hierarchies and bone influences, it becomes very difficult to figure out the, the transforms for different parts of the mesh with respect to the normal. So those are the major weaknesses of object space normal mapping. Only one-to-one -one skins can be used and no animation. Which leads us to the technique of tangent space normal mapping, which is actually the main kind of normal mapping seen today, since it doesn't have the aforementioned limitations. However, it's also a fair bit more complicated, so it'll have to wait until part 3. Until then, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, if you did, please click the like button, helps a lot, and I will see you soon with some more Hardware 3D.